Hey, I hope you're having a good day. This is Elan, and I'm joined by the amazing Neve Hennessy today. And to give Neve uh, a bit of an intro, so Neve is a biomedical engineer with a research master's degree, which focused on the perimyceal collagen in skeletal muscle tissue. I probably didn't pronounce that properly, but did my best. Uh, following studying, um, they worked as a research and development engineer in the medical device industry. Alongside this, Neve pursued a more uh, pursued a more woo woo um, education in their free time, and has trained as a Reiki practitioner and completed yoga teacher trainings in Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, uh, yoga for adults with special needs and kids yoga. In 2021, Neve made the move to Australia where she worked as a yoga teacher and went on an adventure of a lifetime traveling the continent in a van solo. Um, earlier this year, Neve launched their move with Your Seasons course, which provides yoga practices to support the menstrual cycle. And now they are preparing to begin their PhD studies with the goal of creating a device to help restore natural gait in people with Parkinson's disease. So Neve, very welcome. How are you doing today? Thanks, I'm doing pretty well. And um, you've yeah. almost got perimesium, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I wasn't sure if it was peri perimesial or perimesial, but uh, yeah, it's nice. just one of the long Latin names. It's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what I found a lot of the time with anything when it comes to anatomy, physiology, biomechanics. There's a lot of like names and stuff that are in Latin, and some of them can be just like a whole mouthful to try and get get right the first time yeah I'm not sure if you ever get them right the first time unless you're extremely lucky yeah for sure I don't know about you but I, I didn't study Latin in school so no I have only picked up from whatever I'm studying I learned how to say that word really well mm -hmm. and that's as far as it goes Nice. Yeah. So, you know, I was really um, looking forward to um, having a chat with you today because obviously, you know, there's so many different things, you know, we can delve into. And, uh, you know, I suppose initially uh, we connected through my girlfriend, Alicia, you know, doing some meditation uh, a few years ago. Um, I think, you know, we started doing that probably just a few months after COVID had kind of taken hold it was like maybe the summer of like 2020 something like that wasn't it yeah so I started doing those meditations maybe April 2020 and I think you joined maybe a month or two into me doing them um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it was um that was a really big thing for me because like I'd never I'd read a lot about meditation and stuff before but to be honest I'd never really done it properly like probably a minute or two here and there but but no like guided meditation or anything like that so when I first started doing the classes with you that was the first time I ever did like guided meditation and it's like very powerful to do so it was a amazing experience yeah it was great to have you in the group and um, it was just my way of trying to do something during the pandemic like, I think a lot of us experienced that at the beginning of dealing with the pandemic. It was a bit of, what can I do? How can I help? Where's mm -hmm. my place? I was like, well, everyone's very stressed and I've got this skill that I can put out. And it's been amazing because I've connected with friends and likes of yourself and I'm still doing online meditations now, three years later. Nice. Because Sophia, yeah, I think it's... Um... You know, that was probably one of the biggest positives to come out of COVID was the fact that, you know, it's really accelerated or propelled everybody into being a lot more open to, you know, doing stuff via video call. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it really opens up, you know, because um, you're in what, New South Wales right now? Um, I'm in Melbourne, which is the state of Victoria in Australia. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so like if there's no Zoom or video calls, like you're literally on the opposite side of the planet right now. <laughs> yeah, possibly couldn't be much further away from yeah. you, right? 
um because you're in Nina, right yeah exactly in in tipperary yeah. in ireland so it's like i don't know how many kilometers that is but it's probably at least 10 or fifteen thousand kilometers. Oh, it's way further than that. That's... really yeah yeah because when i was in my van trip i think i traveled just around the edge of australia something like 25,000 kilometers so between Ireland and Australia must be in the hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. yeah and don't quote me on it but it's got to be huge yeah it's pretty far yeah so that's um yeah it's it's so cool that we're able to to do something like this you know it's like because even as something I've been thinking about a lot the last couple of years I suppose is like you know this is all such like new technology, you know, even like um, back in 2005. So, you know, when, you know, we were like 10 or 12, there was, mm -hmm. there was no like real video calls. Skype, I don't think was even a thing back then. So it's so new, like the ability to be able to do stuff like this. Um, you know, we're so lucky to, to have that like only one generation ago, like, there was no ability to do this it was like you might get lucky to catch a phone call from someone or you'd have to send you know a letter or something like that to be able to to speak with someone on the opposite side of the world yeah it's pretty cool because I like I grew up my mum's Australian so I've got half my family based here in Australia and like I remember us trialing Skype when I was maybe about that like 11 or 12 and it was the worst <laughs> like we had, I love internet so we couldn't load video it was a complete disaster yeah so being able to just jump on a call today is really exciting like I've been looking forward to our chat nice yeah me too especially after we did the the Reiki session um a couple of weeks ago um so you know Reiki was something that I'd never done before and um you kindly messaged me and being like you know if you want to see what it's like you know we could give it a go so um that's probably one of the things that is more maybe on the side of of woo woo <laughs> yeah. you know, there is the conventional approach of what you know is supposed to be helpful for you know your mental or physical or emotional health there's the conventional and then there's the woo woo or our unconventional but i think uh, until you do something and you experience it you know there's no point sticking a label on it um so i found the reiki like quite good and it kind of felt like a mixture between you know meditation and i'm not going to say a counseling session but it was just nice to be able to chat about you know what kind of feelings like popped up as we were doing it so um that reiki session was was really helpful for me for sure yeah i'm delighted i was I'm like that's something that's come out of this podcast. I was listening to the episode you did. The second one was uh, pretty in-depth. Yeah, Deborah, yeah. So I just was listening to your podcast and you mentioned Reiki offhand and I was like, oh, well, that's something I can do. Um, and I think that's another cool thing about the technology we've got is I was able to go like, well, this is a skill you've already said you're interested in us. Let's, let's go and make it happen. Like I'm really big into just seizing opportunities and tr trying everything mm -hmm. so whether it's conventional or unconventional like just getting the opportunity to go like hey have you tried this or I've got this skill do you want to like do you want to do a, a transfer and it's it's what it was about so it's really good to have you be perceptive to it and also to like hear that you did like got so much out of this and it's really enjoyable for me to be able to share Probably one of my least used skills is the Reiki. I tend to share it with friends and family, but it's not something that I've kind of pursued as much as some of the other things I've studied. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would you say is the reason why, like, is it because, you know, maybe people aren't really as open to it or is just something that you haven't put time into or what would you say the reason for that is? Um, I think I've just had other focuses and um, as will probably come apparent through this chat I'm everything I do kind of comes back to movement like I'm just fascinated with the human body with movement and Reiki I think it's like it's an energy healing technique but it doesn't have the same 
I guess, connection to like the actual anatomy and physical physicality that I really, really enjoy. So it's it's kind of one of those things that I've learned. I like pull it out of my toolbox every now and again, but mm. it's not as grounded in what really fascinates me, which is the the body and how we move. Nice. Yeah. And I always love that analogy, you know, of the toolbox, because um I I've used that a lot in the past as well. It's like it's great to have loads of different skills and you know knowledge in different areas and you know depending on you know who you're with you can pull a, a different thing out of the toolbox to you know try and help that person in, in whatever way um so yeah it'd be great to kind of you know learn a bit more about the biomedical and engineering side of things because like that was really interesting and i was i was thinking like i didn't want to look it up and i was thinking like okay so bio biology medical to do with medicine and then engineering it's pretty obvious but then to combine all three of those together and put it into one field um it's like a lot of intelligence needed to be able to to do something like that for sure so you know I was really interested to try and you know uh you know just wants to hear a bit more about that like what does biomedical engineering look like on a practical level mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's a pretty new field and the well, relatively new field that's kind of, kind of gone mainstream, particularly in Ireland. Ireland's a huge biomedical hub. Mm. And so you've kind of got it right. It's bio to do with biology, medical. It's got a focus on like medicine and how we can help people or also animals. And if you ever watched the bionic vest, that was definitely some great biomedical engineering went into those little animal prosthetics um, and then engineering when you really pair it back is just the, the design and the application of science and mathematics to create something in the real world and um, so you put them all together and it's generally really fascinating it's making things to help people and um, so like I went into engineering, honestly, I didn't even want to study engineering. I just didn't get the points I wanted in my leaving cert. And that was what I got handed. And it turns out it was a really good move for me. Um, and because it's a bit more practical, like I love getting my hands into things. I love figuring stuff out. So going into biomedical engineering is just getting to work things out, getting to figure out solutions to problems um, and all the solutions are for problems connected with biology so do, am I making sense so far yeah no it makes complete sense yeah for sure um so yeah if that what that looks like for a lot of people is the work I would have done as a medical device engineer and um, so I've worked in one company since graduating and that was designing heart valve replacements. So basically anything that is in a hospital or connected to the human body, a biomedical engineer somewhere along the lines designed that. Wow. So it's from CT scans, MRI scans to like needles and stethoscopes mm -hmm. yeah, and everything. Nice. Yeah, they're all examples of different medical devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And with something like a heart valve, like, how do you even make something like that? Like, is it out of, I presume it's not out of human tissue, or is it no. out of some different type of, like, Definitely animal tissue? Not. Or... Um, so I worked on two different heart valves, and we used two different animal tissues. We used... Um, pericardium tissue. Pericardium is a sac that basically goes around your heart to protect it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's made of collagen. So it's like very stuff, very tough, kind of stretchy. It, um, and the devices that I worked on, one used bovine tissue, so from cows, and one used porcine tissue, so it's pigs. So you're it's actually a byproduct from the agricultural industry and 
will, will partner with um, abattoirs and get the pericardium removed from the hearts during that processing stage. So very unique byproduct of agricultural industry being siphoned into the medical device industry. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And is the pericardium, is that mostly fascia that goes around the heart or what um, kind yeah, of tissue? Yeah, it would be close to fascia, um, but it's its own specialized thing. So fascia would is kind of the connection between muscles. Mm -hmm. Um, and the pericardium is it's more isolated so it's um something that kind of keeps the correct amount of pressure around the heart because your heart is a really high pressure organ mm -hmm. and, and then it also creates a right amount of i'm going to go with slide between your heart and your lungs and so it's kind of unique it's not like fascia exactly but it is made up most of the same things as your fashions nice yeah that was like something i was kind of fascinated by a few years ago um this guy yeah Eugene Teo I went to one of his seminars he's like super smart when it comes to anything to do with the human body and he's based in Australia as well but um he mentioned uh fascia and there's a book uh by oh I can't remember who wrote it but Tom Myers I think was who wrote it uh, anatomy trains i don't know if you are familiar with him or any of his work but um it's a really good book all about fascia and it's like as soon as i read it i was like oh my god it's like i didn't even learn about that when i did my degree because i think uh probably an issue when you're learning about the body or biomechanics or anything like that on a piece of paper it's 2d so everything is simplified and it's like there's a bone and on top of the bone is a muscle and on top of the bone or somewhere beside the bone is a ligament or a cartilage and and mm -hmm. from what I can remember fascia wasn't even like mentioned in any of the textbooks that you know I had when when I was doing my degree so it was really like eye opener what do you study um I did sports management and coaching so it's kind of like a broad degree. It's like um, exercise science, nutrition science, coaching with people of all populations. So kids, uh, adults, uh, elderly, and then also did a, a project for a few months working with kids um, that had uh, were somewhere on the spectrum with autism. Um, and then we did like some psychology and um, a lot of practical stuff as well when it comes to like actual training, you know, so like weightlifting, sprinting, a lot of the practical application of like stuff to do with sports, um, anatomy, physiology, so it was quite, quite broad and um, mm -hmm. covered a bit so of everything. Quite a holistic approach, really. You got a bit of everything. Yeah, it was really good, um, you know, foundation, I think, because because there were so many different modules, you could get a good idea of like what maybe interests you and what didn't. So there's definitely some that interest me more than others, that's for sure. Uh, but um, it applies to everyone who does it and to create there's some stuff that it's just not that interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was pretty happy to do that. Um, and definitely learned a lot from it. Um, but with your degree, it sounds like it was pretty specialized in, in one area, was it? Or between biology so and then The way mine worked was I went into a general engineering course. So I spent two years with, I think there were like 300 of us in the class. And we all did oh. the same courses. And then Halfway through our second year, we needed to select what area we'd specialize in for our final two years. Mm -hmm. So I chose biomedical engineering. The other options were computer engineering, electronic engineering, civil, and mechanical. And there was also a computer and electronic combined course. And I very almost went into electronics. Um, but then biomedical was the one that kind of won out. And it's, like I said, I just love the human body. It's just really cool. And 
I'm going to tell you this story. It's kind of like a silly way to make a decision for how, what course of study you go down. But I was walking home from the cinema one night just before Christmas break. And on my way home, I walked past the hospital and I met this old man and he asked me to carry his shopping across the road. Um, so I took his bags and he started telling me all about how he'd had, he'd had his hip replaced and he could move better than he had in years and years. And he was telling me about all of his, his old people friends who'd had different procedures done and it, basically they'd gotten their lives back. And I came away from this three minute conversation fully knowing that I was going to go into biomedical engineering. Wow. Yeah, that's really powerful when you have an, an experience like that, because you know that you can make a positive impact on people's lives by by doing that. So, yeah, it makes it, I think, easier on the days where, you know, maybe you're not in a good mood or feeling stressed or energy energy is lower. It's like, wow, I have this like really important, impactful thing that I can do. You know, it's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool knowing that like whatever I do as a biomedical engineer is eventually going to positively impact someone's life. And if the product goes well, like hundreds or thousands of people's lives, it's like, it's a really good goal to remind yourself of when things get tough. Yeah, for sure. Cause I know you mentioned that you're currently working on, you know, um, working on gate, like your project is related to gate for people who have Parkinson's. Um, mm -hmm. And we can dive into that a bit more. But uh, before I forget it, I was doing a bit of research earlier. And um, mm -hmm. something I mentioned a few weeks ago when we were talking, I couldn't remember what it was called. But it's like, it's called exoplate. I don't know if you've heard about that. But it's basically like a treatment that's been developed for people who suffer with bad tremors with Parkinson's. And a lot of the early trials look like, um, you know, it's had a quite a positive impact on some people's lives where it's reduced the tremors and, you know, they're not as bad as before, but um, I don't have any like personal experience with that. I don't have any like family members that have Parkinson's or um, I haven't worked with anybody that has Parkinson's. So it's quite a, you know, a new area to, to look into. Um, so I think first of all, like for anyone listening or watching, just to explain what GATE is. Yeah, sure. I can start with that. So your GAIT is basically your walk. So your when I say GAIT, I mean your natural ability to walk on two feet. Mm -hmm. And it like your GAIT involves, if you think about when you walk, it's not just that you're moving your feet, you're actually impacting all of your body when you walk. So your your legs are moving, your torso moves, your head moves, your arms are like all reacting to that process of walking. So when I say gait, it means the whole complexity of a walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's spelled G-A-I-T, not G-A-T-E. Yes. Um, yeah, so with the, uh, you know, the current research that you're doing, like, are, are you in, what year are you in for your PhD? I haven't actually started yet. I have the application in and I'm due to begin this winter. So mm -hmm. this summer for you in Ireland. So, so really, are... really to get going, but can't really talk that much because I haven't started it officially yet. I've just done my own little bits of research on like what is Parkinson's disease because like yourself I don't have any real life experience with this mm -hmm. I don't know anyone with Parkinson's yeah that's really interesting and um so for the PhD like how long is that going to be in terms of years three and a half years is what I've got funding for wow. oh nice you got funded for it congrats that's unreal yeah yeah I'm I'm quite excited. It's um, based between the Bionics Institute, which is a really cool um, kind of in-between company here. That's they're like in-between research and industry. 
Mm-hmm. So I'll be based with them and the University of Melbourne. So I'll get to be kind of a hybrid, like semi-industry, semi-research based PhD. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah, it's like um, I did a level seven and it was over three years. And <laughs> the last day when I finished my last exam, I walked out. It was on my birthday. It was lovely and sunny. And I was like, I am never going back to conventional college or university ever again. Like just, mm-hmm. yeah, it, I've always found like, especially over the last few years, just learning directly from people who were at the top of their field or, you know, really well established has been much better than going down the conventional path of, you know, a level eight or a master's or, you know, PhD or, or whatever, but that's just for me personally. Um, but it's really cool to, to hear that you got funding for it. And I was kind of wondering, you know, is it a lot easier to get funding in like Australia versus in Ireland or like, what's the you know kind of the setup when it comes to stuff like that i i'm not sure i know funding is generally difficult everywhere i for this one the project was already fully funded and and i actually got to know about it through a connection i made while i was on my band trip and just going to show that networking really works Mm -hmm. yeah i was staying at a at a bird observatory in the far northwestern corner of Australia when I met the guy that was the CEO of the Bionics Institute. He just recently retired. And we got chatting. I was like, I'm a biomedical engineer, but I'm traveling now. And he basically gave me tips on all the engineering possibilities in the country and said if there was anything in the institute that was of interest, I was to reach out and he would kind of vouch for me. So then this January, when I was looking at different career options and deciding whether I would stay in Australia or go home, I looked up the institute and read about this project and and gate for Parkinson's disease. And I was like, that sounds fascinating went in well sent an email got my introduction went in and basically saw that it was a really cool facility and just been going through the steps now I'm pretty excited to get started nice that's amazing isn't that how like you can just be taking time off doing your own thing and then you just randomly you know bump into to somebody who happens to be a ceo for a company like that and you know kind of has a lot to say for you know being your authentic self and just doing what you enjoy because it's like there's there's one side of me that says like okay sure it could be completely random but then there's also the other side of things of like you know when you're being your authentic self you you know you attract people who are kind of on the same wavelength right so It could be fate, it could be random, who knows, but it's pretty cool all the same though, isn't it? Yeah, it's one of those things I feel like it doesn't really matter whether you call it fate or random, you just need to roll with what comes up. And if if you're your authentic self, I think you're more open to saying yes to things that do come your way. For more people, people are more likely to give you opportunities if you're being true to yourself. Mm -hmm being authentic you're more passionate and just through yeah that's amazing and so with your trip around australia like uh what gave you the uh the push to to do that initially or to you know to make the move from all the way from ireland over and um, so the move from ireland was a mix of a few things i moved in 2021 so it's part way through the pandemic and I have Australian citizenship because I was born in Perth and I was kind of looking at my family who they didn't have any lockdowns. They just seemed to be living normal life. And I was looking at that from the outside going, that would be really, really nice. Um, and I also had something happen at work Christmas of 2020 where 
and a project that I was working on was cancelled and a lot of people were made redundant and there was this I think it was maybe a two or three week period where I was left not sure whether I would have a job in that company again or not and during that time I started to brainstorm what would I do if I was going to be out of work so I had this huge set of pages all over my wall like I was sellotaping and tacking pages to my wall with all of the things that I was interested in and um, it looked like I was trying to or like work out a conspiracy theory or something it was just like all of the things I was interested in thought bubbles going in all different directions me just trying to hone in on what I was what I would do if I was made redundant and one of the things that was there was going to Australia, which I'd always wanted to do. And when it came to it, I wasn't made redundant. But the idea had latched itself inside my brain. So I made the decision in March of 2021 to book my flights and leave my job and go. And I flew in July of 2021. Nice. So Again, it's kind of responding to what life gives you. And then I made the decision to just go and leap for adventure rather than stick with what I knew. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I strongly believe that, you know, if you have an opportunity, like you want to take it because, you know, life's too short not to. And I know for me, I, I for sure when I'm 75 or 80 or even if I make it that far I don't want to look back and be like oh I had the chance to do that why didn't I do it like because I've seen this video on YouTube before I was like regrets of you know uh, 100 year olds or something like that and it interviewed like five or ten uh, centenarians I think they're called when they, when they hit 100 and yeah all, basically some of the most common regrets for every person was like just not doing something when they had the chance to do it, you know? So that's, that's pretty amazing. And had a reminder of that recently as well. Unfortunately, someone in my girlfriend's family passed away only yesterday. And it was only two weeks ago that we were literally over in their house and talking with them. And then, you know, he passed away, unfortunately. And just uh, a big reminder of like, you know, if you do have the chance to do something, like do it because you just never know what's around the corner, or what's going to happen. So, yeah, I'm really happy to hear that you took the chance to do that. And um, so that was like July 21. So that's that's almost two years ago now. So you've been in Australia for two years. Yeah, just about. And I thought I was going out for a year and a half to two years. And now I've committed to another three and a half. So it just goes to show you never know what's coming your way. Um, and yeah, so I've been here almost two years. And I spent the first almost year with my family in Perth working as a yoga teacher. And then the end of May last year, I started my band trip. Nice. That's unreal. And with uh, yoga, when did you first like get into that? Um, I got into yoga as a student when I started my degree um, a friend of mine wanted to go to classes so I said I'd go along with her and I just loved it it was so good for my mental health like it really really was so important for me getting through like just the stress of doing a degree and um, because there's a lot involved and I was quite out of my depth for some of us and it was my first time I moved from being in the countryside in Ireland to Dublin um, and there's a whole bunch of adjustments that come with that and, and I find I found the yoga really really helpful so I just stayed practicing once a week and um, and then once I finished my degree and moved to Galway for work I had to give up my number one hobby, which is ballet dancing. Oh, wow. Okay. I couldn't. That's how Leisha and I met mm -hmm. through ballet. Um, and I just couldn't find a class 
that suited me in Galway as an adult. So I went headfirst into yoga as a real passion. Um, and within, within 12 months of moving to Galway, I'd gone to Portugal to do my teacher training. Nice. That's really cool. So ballet was kind of like the main... Um... Yeah, ballet was, was my main hobby or exercise, I guess, both since I was five or six years old. Yeah, it's unreal. I was going to say, like, I, would you classify ballet as a sport or more of like an art? Because for well, me, I feel I, like a combo of the both. I will go with art form. I just think it's so beautiful and creative that I'll always choose art form over a sport, but it's definitely athletic. Oh, for sure. Like, it's actually kind of crazy how athletic you have to be for ballet like in terms of balance coordination the hamstring calf hip flexibility to be able to lift <laughs> your foot up to your head and to have the rotation in your hip to be able to even you know get your foot into certain positions and like just everything especially like some of the like backward bends like to have the the extension in your spine to be able to do that it's like the flexibility is just on a different level you know for anybody that that practices ballet yeah it's um I am biased for sure because I still love it so much but it's like such an awesome blend of flexibility and strength and performance and creativity that I, I just feel like it's a whole package but seriously athletic and um, and that was another reason that I liked the yoga because it just helped improve my flexibility even more. Yeah. And with yoga, like, um, so I've never actually done yoga, but I. You have, you've meditated. So you've done yoga. Okay. Yeah. So I suppose so. But like my understanding of yoga is that it's more of like a religious practice than what this might be wrong so you can correct me if i'm wrong but that was my understanding that it's more of a religious or maybe spiritual practice and then it's maybe become more mainstream recently and maybe it's lost some of that spirituality and it's become more about stretching and stuff like that but what what would you say is like that the real you know kind of history of it or you know where does it kind of originate from yeah, so it, um, this is something that I still have a lot of learning to do because a lot of it has been westernized, um, but it is not a religious practice, but a spiritual practice. Um, and yoga, the form of yoga that I've studied, there's eight main limbs. Um, and what we know yoga as in terms of stretching and movement would be the fourth limb called asana, which is like a Sanskrit word that's basically like poses or postures and okay. um, the idea is that you follow these eight steps or eight limbs of yoga towards enlightenment or moksha which is I guess the feeling we're all searching for right it's that feeling of being at peace entirely with our place within the universe so like, we've got the yoga that we all know and see on Instagram, which is the asana side of things, but we've also got yamas and niyamas, which are, I guess, philosophies um, or ways to approach yourself and life and meditation, which you've done. So you've done yoga. Um, okay. We've got breath work and I'm struggling to think of the other ones right now. Um, Seems like so hard to remember. Yeah. And um, I'm usually pretty good, but my brain's gone empty. Um, and I don't know how many I've said at this stage. That's all good. There was, there was three or four there. And uh, even like, you know, Sanskrit, that's such a, an ancient language. So it must have been quite hard to even to be able to pronounce or, you know, remember some of those words. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not great at my Sanskrit pronunciations. Um, it's something that I, try to do 
um, I learn kind of one pose at a time. I've got the English versions that I know because I've heard them in class or when I look them up. They're like, we tend to use the English words and I'm doing my own practice of trying to replace the English words with the Sanskrit words over time mm -hmm. to just make it more authentic when I teach. But it's a, it's a slow and gradual process learning Sanskrit. Yeah, I can imagine, like I still struggle with English. So <laughs> fair play who would, you know, learn in that. Like I was, I was trying to learn some languages is always something that I've struggled with a lot. Like even learning Irish from a young age, just couldn't like, I don't know what the issue was, but I could just never learn that. So I ended up doing like ordinary level Irish in, in secondary and same with German, like studied German for, you know, like five years, still had very basic grasp of it. And before I moved to Barcelona last year, I was learning Spanish through some audiobooks. I actually found I learned more through the five or six months of audiobooks than I did in like five years of school. So I think like there's a lot to be said for how you're consuming information it makes a difference to how you retain it as well. Um, but um, yeah, that'd be, be pretty impressive to be able to speak Sanskrit. Yeah, languages were never my thing in school either. I did ordinary Irish and I did French in secondary school and did not pick that up particularly well either. Um, but I did take Japanese when I was in college for two semesters and oh. took Japanese instead of the business module because I didn't want to do business at all. Um, in hindsight now, I probably could do with a bit of business knowledge, but I chose Japanese and that I took on really well because it was fun. Like we used to just practice speaking to each other and we were rated by writing and performing plays and it I think because it was less road learning I took to it a lot better still can't speak Japanese now but at the time I was enjoying it yeah uh, uh the only Japanese word I can think of off the top of my head is uh arigato which yeah. I think is thank you thank you yeah yeah that's that's it like if I uh I'm quite a big fan of like um, Muay Thai and like MMA and stuff like that. So, you know, I follow like a few Japanese athletes and stuff like that. Um, and when you said about eight limbs and yoga, it reminded me in, in Muay Thai, it's, Muay Thai is literally the art of eight limbs. But, you know, it's it's more for like fighting and self-defense than, you know, a, maybe there is a spiritual aspect to it as well that I don't know of. I find a lot of martial arts, there is a spiritual aspect in the background. So I did Taekwondo as a kid and Aikido when I was in college. And I think if you really trace it back, there is roots in a lot of Eastern traditions to that, like, I guess, tapping into the, the, the energy around us or like that, that flow state. I think that's what it is. Like we break it all down into all different words. But what yoga is searching for, what a lot of martial arts search for is flow states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think athletes search for. We just have hundreds of different ways of describing it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking earlier. Like when you're saying about, you know, um, what everybody's, what most people are probably looking for are when they do yoga. They're, they're searching for that state of feeling, you know, one with the universe or whatever you want to call it. But when you said that, I was thinking like, oh, for me, that's just being like present in the moment, essentially. Yeah. So it might be like the same thing, but just using different words to describe the experience. Yeah, I think I think that's what we've done as humans is we're all like finding that experience because when we're in the moment, you're feeling present. We feel so good. Mm -hmm. And I think we've just developed multiple systems to try and find our way back there. Yeah, definitely. Like, I always find that, like, you know, um, if I'm anxious, um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about something 
you know, that happened in the past, or I'm thinking about something that might go wrong in the future, but I'm not in, in a present state. So anytime I do feel like anxious or worried or stressed about something, can I have to take a step back and be like, okay, like I need to do something that gets me back in the present moment. And movement is always the simplest way to do that. Cause if I go for a run or do some skipping or go to the gym, do a workout, there's just like purely in the moment in that I'm not like thinking about anything else. So movement really is like medicine that way to, especially, you know, for our mental health and just um, reducing stress and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it really is. And movement's so important to me. Like whether it's through yoga or whether it's what I'm doing as an engineer, like move. You know, movement's my jam. It's just like the thing that I want to mm -hmm. experience and learn more about for everything because it, it helps your mental health, it helps your body. It's fascinating. Like it is just kind of the answer to a lot of questions I've got is move. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I posted a video on my Instagram yesterday where I was like being very honest that when I first started you know, training and goes to the gym. It was purely for vanity reasons. Literally just wanted to look better physically and feel more confident and gain muscle and all that stuff. But over the last four or five years, it's, you know, my mindset has completely shifted. And my main reason why I, you know, want to do any movement is literally just for my mental health. Cause I know that if I don't do at least like two or three workouts a week or some type of cardio, like I just feel so awful and my mental health score is usually like a could be a three or four out of 10. Whereas if I train regularly, it's like between an eight to a 10 out of 10. So it makes a, a massive difference for me. Um, but have you experienced something similar? Like for the weeks, let's say you go a week or two without doing any movement at all. Like, how do you find that affects you? Um, honestly, I can't remember the last time I went a few weeks without any movement. Nice. Um, even if it's just going for a walk or it, I like I've got a pretty regular yoga asana practice so the yoga stretching and um, that I'll do it would be very unlike me I'd have to be sick to go without some form of movement and um, but I notice if like if I don't move the days I don't move I'll have the lower mental health score than the days I do. And sometimes if I've got a day where I'm not feeling the best, I'm anxious or there's a lot going on, I'll gravitate towards doing more and more movements. So it's kind of like I'll start off, maybe some, maybe something went not the way I wanted in the morning. And once I cop that, I'm like, okay, well, I'll do something. I'll like I'll spend a few minutes stretching or my go-to is a song and a little dance in my room if I'm at home and um, because I just feel like that gets the endorphins up to a thousand very very quickly um, and I'll like do that I'll get myself up and then you go back the day and it's like the, it starts to go down again and then once I hit it I realize it it's like move again and so I'm yeah try to get even if it's just five minutes of movement in multiple times a day, that's how I manage, manage mental health a lot of the time because I'll have good days and bad days. And on bad days, I move a lot more once I cop it. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, isn't it? Just actually having the awareness and just being conscious of how you're feeling because, you know, uh, I think, I know for me for a long time, I was... Un unconscious everything was happening on autopilot and I was just reacting to things and I wasn't really aware of what was going on but now you know that I've you know worked with a counselor a therapist for a while and done a lot more like self-reflection and journaling and whatever else it's like I have that awareness now of like oh yeah like I do actually feel really stressed right now like what do I need to do to get rid of that do I need to you know, just have a nap, sleep more? Do I need to go have a cold shower? Do I need to, uh, you know, go do a workout? You know, it's much easier when you have that 
conscious awareness to try and figure out like, okay, what's something I can do proactively to, you know, help this instead of uh, reacting to things and then, you know, being in like a, a negative spiral, then feeling terrible for, you know, a few days or a few weeks or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's getting those skills, like you said, that you started just getting into fitness mostly for vanity. Like I was kind of the same. I was like very much working towards with dance. It was how to perform the best with yoga. It was like, how can I do the best version of this pose? And then over the last few years, it's been like, oh, actually, I don't need to push myself to injury points. It's actually a lot healthier to stay in an area that's not as stressful on the body, but really, really beneficial for the mind. Yeah, definitely. There's a a scale that I got from powerlifting when I used to train that a lot in the past. It's called the RPE scale or rate of perceived exertion. Um, Have you... Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it, but I'm not very familiar. It's really easy to use, but it's just like, you know, um, if you go at a 10 out of 10, you know, it means that you, you know, won't be able to do any more reps or, you know, um, on a particular exercise. But the reason why I want to bring it up is because um, any, you know, approach when it comes to movement or training, when you look at the exercise science, and I've definitely experienced this myself as well. It's like when you stay somewhere around a seven to an eight out of 10 of what you're able to do, that's where you're going to get the best results from everything. Because it's like, if you're pushing yourself at 70 or 80%, it is going to be challenging. So you're creating enough of an internal stimulus in your body that it's going to react to, but it's not so hard that it's going to cause you to get injured or have a huge impact. Um, you know, in terms of like being really fatigued for, for too long. So there's definitely like a sweet spot when it comes to, to movement and, uh, you know, obviously days where you feel sick or, you know, you're not just feeling that good. If your HRV score is lower or whatever, you can always just go lower, you know, go at like a four or five out of 10. So I always find those, those, uh, subjective scores are like, they're, uh, kind of easy to use. And so it's like, it's easy to implement then as well. Yeah, it works as well because subjective when it comes to the body is kind of the way to do things because what your seven is could be my 10. Mm. Like, and I guess to like bring in the menstrual cycle, my seven this week could be like my, my seven this week would probably be my five next week so it like it changes so constantly and it's the same like yes hormones will affect me but also mental health in terms of if something really stressful has happened yeah like it's it all affects how you can how you can use the body that you've got yeah absolutely like i've i've seen that in real time with uh with people especially when I used to train people one-to-one in the gym. Like I always remember there's there's one girl that I was working with and, um, you know, she was really strong, like over, we were working together for about five or six months, but she was like doing like full push-ups and could do like three or four pull-ups and was like really athletic and, and strong. And when she was like at in the last week of her cycle before she got her period, her strength would just like drop massively and she'd go from being able to do three or four pull-ups to struggling to do even one. Mm-hmm. And But then as soon as she got back to week one of her cycle, like the strength was literally back like that. And it was like plain sailing for a couple of weeks. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to, you know, why I work with a lot of people on kind of, you know, I suppose menstrual cycle awareness of like what's most likely going to happen at each stage, because at least if you know that like, okay, I probably am going to not feel as strong as I usually do in in this week or 10 days. It's like, okay, I don't need to beat myself up about it then, you know, and feel less motivated or, or anything, you know, give yourself a, a break. And um, yeah, I think that's a huge part of it when it comes to to training is like, it's very easy to get 
demotivated and frustrated and as soon as that comes in it's like oh it nearly makes you feel like you want to give up and not do anything so if you can kind of remove that and be like okay this is just normal thing that happens then you know makes it easier to I suppose continue in the long run yeah because I think that like that week or 10 days before your cycle is probably the point where you could give up entirely and you're like well I've worked so so hard and now I can't do anything that is the trigger point where it, like I would be tempted to not not do anything for the next few days I'm like well there's no point I will be any good at this yeah but yeah that's not the way to go about things because just trying to be good at something is not really the reason for approaching any of these exercises it's for the mental health benefits and the long-term benefits not just the always hitting the same target all the time yeah no exactly way. yeah it's like the uh you know getting stronger getting fitter hitting personal bests all that stuff is really cool but that's almost like a nice side benefit because if your mental health score is higher and your stress is lower and you've got more energy and you feel better then like at the end of the day that's the most important thing and you know everything else then just comes as a nice you know consequence of that which is great yeah yeah it's kind of like the little extra reward or every now and again like no one's hitting new personal bests every day no that's definitely not manageable I wish that were the case because <laughs> if it was yeah. I'd probably have a, a 600 or 700 pound deadlift at this point but <laughs> that's not the case <laughs> it was one thing with my yoga practice and um, I when I started to get really into it and I was going five days a week to a hot yoga studio I saw my flexibility increase really really quickly and my teacher I remember was like you're getting close to your plateau and I was like what and then it hit and it was just like I had done really really well and then for maybe three or four months I didn't see any improvement in my practice mm -hmm. and that was really really challenging to just go like well I'm doing the exact same thing with my body and no like nothing's changing I'm getting worse sometimes yeah the law of diminishing returns yeah and it's just like it's hard for your body to create muscle at that rate like it's like we are a biological system and it responds really really well to stimulus to begin with and then once you adapt to that that stress or that strain of exercise it's really natural that your body will find the most efficient way to do things and that will stop you from seeing that like incremental gain over and over and over again because mm -hmm. your body's like well we do this all the time let's get really good at this and create an efficient pathway yeah definitely I um I have like a weekly Q&A that I do with all the people that I work with and um I did like a presentation on barriers to your success in the long term a few weeks ago and that was one of the points that I made it's like you need to have the awareness of you know realizing that you you can only make so much progress and that especially especially when it comes to uh you know getting fitter stronger when you when you're focusing more on like workouts and stuff like that you will make the most quickest progress uh in the your first year essentially and then you know realistically you're probably if you're really consistent you're going to max out what your body can do in about four or five years and so having a, a realistic kind of look at like okay like I am going to make quick progress for you know this first year but then it is going to slow down so having other things to focus on you know to get me through that you know like kind of what we said you know just keep my energy levels high my mental health score high stress down but um, that is one of the challenging things is that you're not going to progress quickly forever. And um, it can be a bit off-putting. But uh, yeah, the good thing is if you're in it for the long term, if you're consistent for three or four years at anything, you'll get super good at it. Like really, really good. Like I think I I was looking at some 
photos of me from like 2016 and I've pretty much had the exact same physique for the last like seven years. So I made all of that progress in the first four years, but over the last seven years, I've like made a lot of developments in, in other areas. So, you know, it's like physically on the outside might look the same, but cardio is a lot better. Coordination is a lot better. Skipping, I can do that a lot easier. You know, there's different exercises that I didn't do in the past that I can do now. So like, there's always something that you can do as soon as you get good at one thing. It's like, you know, a simple example would be like, you get good at push-ups, and it's like, once you got good at that, it's like, you can go over and get good at some other exercises like pull-ups or, or something else, you know? So there's always something new that you can do, or that's going to be fun or challenging in some way. Yeah. And I think you've just come back around to the point of, I think a lot of us start exercising or training with that idea of improving the aesthetic of our body. We want to look a certain way, but then once you've been doing something for three or four years, I think it's really natural to not be doing it for the sake of what you look like anymore. You're doing it for the joy of the movement and the progression of, I couldn't do this before and now I can, or I've added complexity or I've added more reps or I've like just opened up a whole area that I never thought I'd be able to do. Mm -hmm. And like two years ago, I did my first headstand. I never thought I'd be able to do that. And and now I'm able to like, do that without any support from a wall. But if you'd asked me even a year before then, I'd be like, mm, no. And I wasn't training to be able to do it. It was just something that once every now and again, I'd give a go. But because I was training everything else through yoga, I had like conditioned all the muscles in a way that I was just able to go in and do it more easily without specific training. And I think that's something that a lot of us get with long-term exercise is just that general awareness of the body. And it can be applied to all different new exercises and just, just ways to have fun. Like, I think if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Like you've chosen the wrong thing. It's got to be fun. Exactly. Yeah, that's what always kind of guides me. Like I always want to go with my, my good instincts. So like... I was focusing a lot on powerlifting, which is basically bench press, uh, barbell squat, and deadlift. And I did that for like four years pretty consistently. But then I got to the point where I was like, uh, I'm not really enjoying this as much. It's like, I really enjoy doing deadlifts, but doing the squats, I was getting a lot of knee pain because I tore the cartilage in my knee when I was like 13. So I was constantly aggravating that. Doing the bench press was never really that strong at, but I was constantly getting elbow tendonitis and uh, rotator cuff pain and pec pain. I was like, I don't think it's really worth it to be honest, I'm not enjoying it. So just switched it around and just started finding movements that I could do pain-free that I enjoy. So yeah, I think some people get, get trapped in that. It's like your whole identity can form around the thing that you do. So then you feel like you almost have to keep doing that. And uh, can be hard to kind of walk away from, but yeah, I think it's super important. Just do something you enjoy, and then it's going to be much easier to keep doing that for a long time. Yeah, definitely. And you can always come back to something like I stopped ballet dancing, but now that I'm living in a city where I can go again, I've looked up schools and I'm going to return to dance. So it's always one of those things where you can take a break and go back and maybe through strengthening through something else you won't get the same injuries again mm -hmm. but it's yeah you've got you've got to go with your passion you've got to go with what's the most fun and exciting like whether it's exercise or whether it's travel or your career like you said at the beginning like you just got to go with the gut feeling I think. Yeah, for sure a big experience for me was like uh i and there's nothing there's no like I've nothing against people who work in warehouses or anything but I worked in a warehouse for a few months um back in like second year of college during the summer just to try save up some money for for a final year and I remember just like wake struggling to wake up at seven or seven thirty and 
going to the warehouse at eight o'clock and literally like packing boxes until like 4 p.m. and did that whole summer. And I was like, oh, I actually hate that job so much. Like I have to be self-employed because I just, I can't, I can't do something like that or work for anybody else. And um, I knew that if I could find something that I enjoy doing, then it would be so much easier. So it took me a while to figure out, but I eventually figured out that, yeah, if I, you know, did like personal training or coaching of some type, that would probably make me happy. And uh, yeah, it has, has made me pretty happy over the last few years. Um, so what would you say for you is the thing that you're like, at the moment makes you the happiest or you're the most, you know, intrigued by? Oh, my, mine changes a lot. I find it really hard. I don't think I've got one thing. Um, so like exactly at this moment, while I'm in kind of a transition place between long-term travel and starting research, I've been loving painting. Like uh, I've just got these big pieces that I've started to paint on my wall and I'm really enjoying those. But if I go like in terms of career, I like a bit of um flexibility and diversity in what I'm gonna do. So like when I did my masters, that was fully self-driven. And so I didn't have any classes or anything. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that environment because it was just a solid year to delve into something I was fascinated in, which was muscle tissue. Um, because with a background in just loving movement, muscles were a fascination. And I was like, I get to spend a year learning things that no one's ever discovered before about these. And um, so that was kind of my research. And that's why I decided to return back to that for the PhD now. And um, needed a long break. I was not able to go into more academia by the time I finished my master's. Um, and then when I was working as an engineer, that was also a really dynamic workplace. Like it was, I just, I think what it comes down to is I really like learning things and I like figuring stuff out that hasn't been figured out. And so as long as I've got something to work on and to puzzle out, I'm pretty happy. And I'm more happy if what I'm puzzling out is connected to like people or movement or like yeah I guess helping helping people move or experience their lives better is like the big goal and then the like small thing is just working out how things work yeah amazing it's like it gives you a higher sense of just a, a sense of purpose I suppose yeah and just the career that I've chosen is not very would be very hard to do it self-employed I'd, yeah <laughs> from the little we've talked about it, I could imagine it's it's a very like niche kind of it's a big area but it's definitely niche for it's, sure it's pretty niche and something that I personally love is working with people like I love being able to throw ideas out to someone or like collaborate and brainstorm on something and mm -hmm. which I really enjoyed as my previous work as an engineer just getting to like 20 people working on this problem and we all have our own little niche area within us but it's all like moving towards something bigger yeah, yeah that's amazing yeah I think it's so important to figure out what's uh you know what's right for you because um you know like uh Gary V talks about it the whole time it's like there's some people who make you know 40,000 a year and they're super happy and there's some people who make 10 million a year and they're miserable and you know and then it could be vice versa and it's like you know you want to just figure out what is the right thing for you to do you know and not have people tell you what they think you should do because um I know for me being self-employed is just what I enjoyed most but I've had some friends who were self-employed for a while and then they figured out that oh, I'm actually much happier being like, um, you know, doing operations in somebody else's company. So it's like, 
they can still be really proactive. They can do, you know, sales or different operational stuff or whatever. Um, but they're not the CEO or they're not the the main, you know, person in the company. They're just working within it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then same goes for you. You know, it's like if you're working in a team with other people, that dynamic, you know, is is probably, you know, better for you. So it's like everyone has their own thing that that works for them. So I think figuring that out is is really big but it's a hard thing to to figure out as well because then you feel like pressure from maybe your parents or from other people you know and it's very easy to like compare yourself with like oh this person is doing that thing and it's like oh maybe i should try and do that and you know i think uh the less i always just try and forget about everybody else and just think like okay what makes me happy and then just focus on that and yeah not worry about what anybody else is thinking yeah, you've really hit it there. Um, because I actually I've been self-employed teaching yoga since I moved to Australia. And um, because you know, I just didn't feel like I, what I had as in here was quite right. Um like what was working full time and then I was teaching yoga two evenings a week. And so I've like done that balance between two things for a while and then I came out to Australia and basically got asked to teach in studios straight away um, and went and went through the whole I, I set up my business I've got my like business number here and I've done all of that and it just I just felt I was lacking in not getting to use all of the I guess the technical engineering side that I'd studied so hard for and um, part of me would love to start my own company someday but I have a lot more ground to cover in terms of my own proficiency as an engineer before that's something that I can go for and I need an idea as well um, but I think it's something I would do well in once I've got the technical skills nice well I'd love to give you a suggestion if you're open to it yeah to suggest a way I'm definitely open so if you could make something like an Iron Man suit, that would be like perfect. Okay. Yeah, but more like the, oh, what's it called? I'm going to forget it now. But one of the newest suits, I don't know. Do you, do you uh, watch any like? Uh, yeah. or... Which suits? Because he made a loss. Yeah, it's one of the newer ones. Oh, it has a really cool name. Uh, Nanotech, that's what it was. Nanotech. Yeah, it was like literally just like, press the I can't remember what it's called the thing that he has in his chest and then it's like the the nano particles basically like create a suit around them and yeah it's pretty pretty cool yeah that's pretty cool so um, kind of the same as in Big Hero 6 have you seen that oh I have Disney. actually seen that it's it's like this Disney movie and this kid creates these nanobots and they can basically do whatever he wants through like a mind chip so when where's the headband, the bots just go and create everything. So the idea is definitely out there. Um, I have a feeling some someone's got to be trying to make that already. Oh, one hundred percent for sure. Like yeah. I follow a few different channels on YouTube, and they're purely like engineering channels where they like take a concept from you know sci-fi, and then they'll try and create it in real life and yeah it's pretty interesting to see there's one channel actually um it's called hacksmith industries and uh the guys that run that are all engineers and yeah they've created like a real lightsaber or um like a john wick suit so basically like a three-piece suit but it's like bulletproof mm -hmm. and um some some things from like iron man and like wolverine claws and stuff and um oh, really cool stuff Pretty cool, yeah. But just obviously not the exact same as what's in the film, but a good yeah. kind of like attempt at it. As close as a few people can make in their free time. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I've always been like real, if you want to call it nerdy that way. I've been like a big sci-fi fan for as long as I can remember. I started watching Star Wars when I was like two or three years old, so it's been like a fascination since I've been young. So. Yeah, I'm kind of the same. I love 
sci-fi, just fantasy, if get just and anything that's to the future or otherworldly just fascinates me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Was there any like games you played when you were younger that you know uh you already got immersed in or was there some series you seen or I was never much of a game person and um, even now like I, I tend to get headaches when I play games um, I'm, the, I'm the exact same <laughs> you're the first person I've ever met who also has that I always feel like I'm really soft or something like I can't play a game because I get headaches yeah it's it's really weird like the uh I love playing like Xbox or PlayStation stuff, but if I, and I've nearly timed it before that if I am like looking at a screen for longer than like an hour, I'll feel like a headache starting to come on and I can get like really bad where I have to literally go sleep or even if I take like two uh, paracetamol or ibuprofen, it's just, I, I don't know. I think it's like something to do with my eyes, something like that, but I'm not sure exactly what causes it. I just feel like they're very overstimulating between like the graphics and the sound and if you're playing a game you're very like this really into us yeah. like if, if I'm playing I'm playing with my whole body I'm like moving <laughs> <laughs> and yeah I, I tend to develop headaches so mm -hmm. games have never be, really been my thing but I've like just read a lot growing up and and trying to think like the earliest sci-fi-ish movie I probably watched was like maybe like Zathora did you see that it was like uh, Jumanji but in space I don't think so no it was, it was Jumanji but in space and it was really cool okay I've seen, <laughs> I've seen Jumanji I've seen I've seen both of those uh but I don't think I've seen Zathora yeah um, and yeah, just like grew up reading a lot of fantasy, and then I think that kind of bled into sci fi as I got older. Nice, yeah, that's cool. I've seen a uh, really probably one of the best series I've watched, it's called The Expanse. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Yeah, it's basically like um, based in like the 24th century, and a lot of like planets in the solar system have been colonized. So people are living on Mars and there's different smaller like moons and stuff off planets that are colonized. And then I don't want to give away a, the plot of it because it, honestly, it's really good. It's a bit slow, like for the first season, but if you stick with it, it gets like unbelievable. It kind of reminds me, it's like, it's probably like what a real life version of Star Wars would be without Jedi and like magical powers and stuff like a, a realistic idea of probably what it would be like you know in the future when you know people are actually able to you know go to different planets and and stuff like that but it's yeah really good yeah okay cool um yeah just I just love space bit of space travel is always really good um, but I'm not not a huge watcher of a lot of TV or series. Um, I'll tend to do movies or I read a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the main media consumption. Nice. We're literally the opposite that way. Like I've always had a poor attention span when it comes to reading books. So I could read a book probably like three or four pages and then I'll either be getting bored or I'll like fall asleep. But um I've I use Audible the whole time so I think I've got like 75 books in my Audible now and uh, I've been averaging about yeah about 10 10 to 12 per year uh, since That's since 2016 it's like I don't know why but if I go out for a walk or if I'm in the gym or cycle or whatever I'll just put on a book and I'll absorb the information and can you know retain it and i'll remember you know most of it and can get through the books like really quickly but if i sit down try to read a book like just doesn't work like <laughs> my brain just can't like for whatever reason so that's because like i 
was very resistant to audiobooks for a really long time. Oh, really? And yeah, I just, I just thought that they weren't real reading. Like I had this prejudice. <laughs> and, but I started listening to audiobooks while I was on my band trip last year. And I listened to all the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books. That's what I started with. Nice. And they're, they're really good. And now I've introduced audiobooks to like my reading schedule. And it is really nice to go out for a walk or to be driving or doing something and having a story told. Yeah, for so sure. I'm, I'm converted. I'm no longer prejudiced against audiobooks. That's good to hear. Yeah, I haven't actually um, listened to any fiction at all. It's all it's all just been knowledge based stuff. You know, whether it's like to do a the menstrual cycle or perimenopause or menopause or exercise science or um, biochemistry or you know psychology. It's all been like factual stuff. But I definitely want to get probably a few like Star Wars books or something and and listen to those something a bit lighter yeah do it all i can suggest some different sci-fi books for you and definitely i tend to have a mix i you know i do audiobooks i've got a kindle and i'll have a physical book so i'll usually have at least three books on the go at once and one of them will be non-fiction one of them will be fiction and the other one could be either way depending on what's going on Mm -hmm. so because I find if I only have one I'll get a bit bored unless unless I've gotten really into a fiction book they're the ones that I'll focus on for hours whereas I find if it's non-fiction three or four pages is more than enough interesting yeah I'm kind of like the opposite that way I'm like I go into it being like, I'm like a sponge. I want to absorb all of the information. I want to know everything about that. So I try and just like do one book and then listen to all of that and then go on to the next book. And with some books, I'll, I'll come back to it as well. But um, yeah, I usually put it on like 1.3 or 1.5 times speed as well. Yeah, and I'm on 1.5 or 1.7.5, 1.75. Yeah, some some people read quite slowly as well. So some books you can definitely speed it up a bit. Yeah. And some people are really slow at reading. <laughs> I know they're doing it so that it's easy to understand. But there was one I started earlier this year. And I think I did it all on double speed because it was just so slow. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's unreal. Um, I just looked at the clock and we've already been for like nearly an hour and a half. Um, and I'm going to. What'd you say? You heard they even went into biomechanics. Which is... I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, I know there's just so much like to discuss and, and talk about, you know, so it's like we could always um, maybe have another, you know, chat where we just talk about biomechanics specifically but I was like you know the whole reason why I wanted to do a podcast was honestly like something I felt like I was lacking a lot over the last year or so was just kind of connecting with other people because that's probably the worst thing about being self-employed it's can be like very lonely and it's like um, even though I have you know like uh, Katie who's my social media manager and I have Karen who's one of my assistants and would have you know a meeting short meeting like two or three times a week still like you know the uh just can get quite lonely that way so I was like it'd be great to connect with more people and kind of branch out a bit and you know do something different so it's, I just find you know when I'm speaking with other people it's better to just let the, uh, the conversation just flow wherever it goes you know and um because I I find like if you try and force something that just doesn't like feel right you know it's almost feel like I'm back in college so um but yeah it's been really nice to to chat today and uh if you're open to it we could always uh you know organize another one in future jump on when I 
know a bit more about Parkinson's disease and my device that I'm making and start starting on that, maybe. Nice. And like um for you know yoga and meditation and, and stuff like that. Um do you want to maybe share some of your details of where maybe people could get in contact with you if they, you know, even just wanted to learn more about stuff like that or maybe do some yoga or meditation with you? Yeah. Um so got two main places. Um I've got my Instagram, which is me Penacy Yoga. Um and then I've also got a website which is mepennessy.com. So I'm assuming my name will be spelled on this podcast. So let's go from there. Um, and yeah, the Instagram page is mostly just, I'm not that active on it, but it's posts about when I got my monthly meditations and um, any classes that I'm doing in person and me trying new yoga poses that I've never done before I'll post like videos of me failing at yoga um which is really fun and then the website is just a bit of everything it's all of my non-engineering stuff put into one website so it's got my yoga it's got SDG meditate which is another little project that we could have talked about um and it's got like some of my photography and poetry and stuff so it's a to capture all amazing sounds good but i'll um you know i'll post the links down below mm -hmm. so if you're watching this on youtube it'll be in the description and same in the, on uh whatever podcast platform you listen on it'll be in the description as well and uh yeah thanks so much for your time today neve it was really great to chat and um hope you enjoy your evening because it's seven well seven or eight p.m there now it's just eight thirty now Nice. Okay. Well, hope you have a good evening. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, I'll end the recording here, but um, you know, we can have a quick chat after if you want. Cool. Thanks, Elan. Welcome. Really nice to chat.